So welcome everyone to a lunchtime webinar or discussion on AI versus human insights. And in this session, we're going to be focusing on the future of risk management. So we've got four great protagonists um, lined up this morning and uh, as a, a lunchtime rather. And as a uh, part of our sort of uh, 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 pre-meeting just to check the different perspectives we're going to come in at. Um, I'm uh, pleased to say that we do have some perspectives that are either end of a spectrum, so I'm looking forward to a lively discussion. Please add your thoughts uh, to it as well. Um, before we kick off, I just want to reflect on, um, you know, we're, we're talking about AI versus human insight. Another word for human insight is gut feel or intuition or you know uh, how, how do we make sense of what's going on um, but when we think about that in the context of risk and risk management you know let's just frame it so what do we mean by by risk and the sort of definitions that exist across the various bodies of knowledge um, that uh, we use for uh, project management it's a, an uncertain event that should it happen um, will have an impact on the project's objectives. And I know there's variations of that, but that's a reasonable one for us to, uh, to use as a basis. So in order to have some insight, um, we need to understand um, the causes of that uncertainty uh, and also the likely impact on the project objectives. And that's quite a degree of analysis um, that we need. So can data help us with that? Absolutely. And whether that's, you know, the mechanical and manual processes that we've been using to collect data uh, and do some analysis of it to make sense of that, uh, or are we going to go down a more uh, automated or more uh, AI generated approach to, to gain in that, something we're going to be debating here. And one of the things we also need to think about is how that impacts the sort of um, the methods and frameworks and the models and therefore the roles that we have in managing risk as well. And, and interestingly, the uh, Future of Work report 2023 that came from Microsoft um, back end of last year, um, I think the nearest sort of uh, role family that we can uh, compare within that report is what they call the professional services line. And they say that they feel that, um, you know, 31% um, of professionals are going to be insulated um, so the you know the introduction of AI uh, on projects you know, won't affect those professionals. At Thirty-one percent, so a bit of symmetry here. Um, their role will be augmented, so their role will be enhanced by using AI. And interestingly, nearly forty percent, so thirty-eight percent, their role will be significantly disrupted. So it will be different to what they're doing. Uh, today. So, so that's sort of some food for thought. And that's just to say the, the analysis that Microsoft had done around the future of work. Uh, and interestingly, a uh, discussion that we uh, have, uh, have been having is comparing our project management roles to uh, other domains. And there's been some interesting discussions. In fact, there was a declaration made two years ago that the role of the radiographer will go. And the prediction was that it would go within two years. Um, because of the ability for uh, AI to do the analysis and the uh, the, the understanding of uh, of, of the scans. Uh, and interestingly, there was a discussion with Andrew Ung, the uh, co-founder of Google Brain, uh, just a few weeks ago, and he reported back on that challenge to say, actually, there are more radiographers today than there were two years ago. And he predicted there'll be more radiographers in two years' time than there are today, because they're in that group that's insulated uh, in terms of the augmentation of AI into their role. So what I'm going to do before I introduce uh, our speakers and just do a quick um, um, uh, hello, uh, your name and, and where you're from, I thought I would just share a poll um, just to capture your thoughts um, before um, I influence it too much with my introduction. So um, let's hope my link works again i've lost it already so first question for you just want to know uh, how much or how are you using uh, ai uh, to manage risks in your area and um, so you've got uh, a number of there sort of from just dabbling piloting checking it out to you know reading up thinking about it to, it's already in use but perhaps just for some tasks or some part of the process or something that's fully integrated I can see we've got a number of 
responses coming in, still not that many. Okay, it's just jumped now, so I'll leave another 10 seconds. So, how is it settling down? So, our panelists in a moment can think about um, your answers in context of over half the people attending this webinar are thinking about it, which is good. Um, some are dabbling and piloting, a small percentage of people, about 10% or so, don't have any plans. Um, and only about 5% of people uh, are using it and very few have it fully integrated. So that's interesting. So keep that in mind in terms of uh, the degree of experience that we've got um, on, on the webinar. OK, so the next question. Do you believe or what extent do you believe uh, risk management uh, in projects will be transformed? And we set a horizon there, so three years. So within three years, how different is it likely to be? And it's a scale of one to ten. So uh, one is basically it's going to be exactly the same as it is now, no real change at all. And number ten is it's you, know, you can't imagine how different it will be. Again, we've got most of the people have covered that now. So um, I'll have to try and interpret this in the right way. So the highest rank is for eight out of 10, followed by seven, uh, and then it's three. So it's a little bit of a, it's not a sort of histogram. It's not a sort of a normal distribution there we've got. So we've got some people thinking it's going to be radically different. And we've got a few others at the other end of the spectrum and a, and a few in the middle. So a bit of a split audience, which is going to be great for our discussion in a moment. And again, next question then on a scale of one to 10, um, what extent do you believe the risk manager role will be placed would be replaced by AI? So this would be that sort of uh, in that Microsoft Future of Work report, it would be the sort of disrupted by. So what extent do you believe the role will be replaced? So it's quite a provocative question here. We're not saying it'll be changed. It'll be, you're, you know, if you're a risk manager, you'll no longer be needed on your project. OK, so interpreting those numbers again, uh, mostly down in the low numbers. Um, so it's um, ranked number one is three, five. OK, so we actually, no, I'll, I'll take that back. We are middling on this one. So most people feel it's going to be somewhat uh, replaced. So perhaps some of the roles will be replaced, not all of the risk manager roles. OK, my last uh, question to kick us off. Um, to what extent do you believe risk managers' importance to project success will be elevated um, by the use of AI in project management? So what we're saying here is that the sort of unique skills and the role that risk managers have means that as they go forward, they'll be relied upon even more than they are today to make sense of what's going on with the analytics and the capability that AI is going to provide us. So one is that your role is going to be less important and 10 your role is going to be even more important than it is today. OK, so I've um, got a few more results coming back in, but you can see here the top ranking one there is uh, 8 out of 10, so it's scoring relatively high, uh, some in the middle, and then the third one is, uh, is, is number three, so relatively low. So again, it seems like we have a, a bit of a split um, group on here. So that's some good context for us to uh, to get going. Right, I mentioned um, we've got four uh, protagonists um, who are going to give us different perspectives today. So if I just uh, ask you just to, to give your, your name and, and where you're from to start with, and then I'll introduce you in the order that uh, I've got you on my uh, on, on my list here. So um, uh, Wes, you just want to say uh, hello and who you are. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Afternoon, everyone. Wes Cadby, Head of Risk Management for Sellafield Nuclear Site and Deputy Chair of the Institute Risk Management's Infrastructure Special Interest Group. Great. Thank you, Wes. Martin. Thanks, Andy. So, pleasure to see you all today. Um, so, I'm Martin Paver. I'm the Chief Exec of Projector Success uh, and the founder of the Project Data Analytics Committee back in 2017. I'll be working on the Project Data Analytics Task Force and the APN Data Advisory Group and much more beyond. So thank you. Looking forward Great. to today. Thanks, Martin. Mark, can you introduce yourself? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Turner. I'm Managing Director of MCT Limited, which is a private uh, software risk management consultancy company. And finally, Rob, can you say hello? 
hi everyone. A um, little bit of fun with headsets so I'm not using. Um, hi, Robert Balam, I'm chair of the APM RISIG, um, risk consultant for Atkins Realis, uh, currently working on the wonderful High Speed 2 programme. Thank you. Brilliant. So thank you, Rob. So um, the batting order we're going to kick off with. So I did my introduction in terms of what is a risk and thinking about that uncertainty and how we sort of um, need to use data to help us with that. But I've, um, I've always been uh, taken by this book here, so Radical Uncertainty, so uh, by Kay and King, so um, Mervyn King, the, um, the uh, uh, former uh, governor of the Bank of England. Uh, and there's some great guidance in here about how we just, you know, make sense of things. So they rely a lot about sense making. So I think there's content in here that would put us more to the human insight end of the spectrum than the AI end of the spectrum. So what I thought we'd do to get us started on the concept of uh, uh, sense making and sort of provide that sort of landscape about how AI can sort of augment what we do. I thought I'd start with uh, with Wes. So Wes, would you like to give your provocation, you know, sort of three minutes or so in terms of your thoughts on AI versus human insight in the world of risk management? Yeah, absolutely. Just to know, Andy, your your camera seems to be having a rave of its own and, and flashing, okay. so I don't know whether you might want to uh, just Let turn it off see if I can uh, reset for a second. Um, so, so what does it mean to me? And I've thought about this a lot for the last two years. Two years ago, AI to me was firmly um, in the science fiction arena. It was all about robots taking over the world uh, and all that sort of stuff. And the acronym AI seems to be a daily uh, a daily term now that's being used. So the the speed at which systems, technology and processes has gathered pace means that, that people are actively trying to take advantage of it. One thing that I don't believe is that we actually have AI if you define AI as artificial intelligence. And to pick up on a phrase you used at the beginning, uh, and the, it's uh, augmented intelligence. It's a phrase a colleague of mine uses quite regularly. We don't have artificial intelligence. We have augmented intelligence. We have systems and algorithms and wondrous approaches that allow us to delve into and deconstruct and repurpose huge volumes of historic and live data to give us a concise output, a succinct output that allows us to better make a decision, which can only be good uh, for the risk management profession. It's going to free up time. It's going to free up resource. It's going to allow people to get away from the more admin based tasks and support value add uh, decision making, which all of our organisations and all of our, our projects uh, need. I think when any of these technological advances gives us something new that we didn't already know that it hasn't worked out from being fed the information we give it when it starts to think for itself and gives us something that we had no idea could possibly be something we need to worry about or something we need to embrace that's when we've got artificial intelligence and i don't think i'll see that during my career lifetime so what will it mean to the risk management profession um i was one of the ones that said we are dabbling playing with with using augmented intelligence to support uh, risk management um and i think the profession is maybe at a cliff edge at the minute it can either sink or swim i just think it needs to change the way it views its role within the organization um I know Martin on the call will talk about one of his objectives, which is to retire the risk management profession uh, in its entirety, not because he doesn't like us as risk managers and risk management professionals, but he just thinks that there's a better way to do it. And I do think augmented intelligence will, will give us that. Um, I think removing the human element of bias and workshop facilitation is going to be the first step in the dance and when that happens the risk management profession needs to be able to direct control and be the owners of, of these new fantastic systems and algorithms that that allow us to get the data to then prompt uh, decision making from from risk owners so i think it will be a gradual process i'm fairly certain the risk management profession will be around for at least the rest of of my career but unless it moves with the times, I think it, it will it will move quicker than uh, than we expect. So that's my position in Andy. Great, thank you, Wes. So Martin, you were name checked there, so I want to bring you in uh, to be second uh, here, which is your quest 
to as uh, we're said to uh, replace okay. the the risk profession or at least sort of radically change how we do risk management so thank you andy um and a great introduction and a bit of scene setting from wes so thank you wes um so the past 30 years i've been a uh, project professional right? i've been a project manager i've led a billion dollar job i've worked on a 10 billion uh, portfolio um and for me, in terms of risk management, it's been the, the human process of guessing what's going to go wrong. And I think part of that is we can't demonstrate to the profession what impact that a sort of risk managers had on the successful outcome of a project or otherwise. So in terms of the issues that came into that project, how many of those went through the risk register in the first place? We've just done a piece of an analysis for a big client, and they've said from their project sort of variations, the 70% of those have not got a connection to the risk register. So, in terms of the risk profession, can they quantify how good their data is? So, what are the metrics and the KPIs on which they're making all of these informed decisions? And I don't think they can at the moment. So some of the data I see is it's just laden with sort of empty boxes. People don't fill it in. We spend the time sort of feeding the machine. So risk is just one cause of variance. So in terms of risk management, we think, well, those are the things that's likely to go wrong in a project, but they're not. That is just one subset of what is likely to sort of emerge on that project. So there's things such as change control, there's logistics, the approvals process, technical queries. So the fact that we didn't learn from all the previous projects that's been in the past, so we're not leveraging that experience, so we'll make the same mistakes again. So why do we segment this variance into these functional silos um, which have existed for 40 years? So what's the logic behind those silos? I can't see that logic today. I think it's a thing of the past, and through machine learning, we can just segment that data in loads of different ways. You can do it through a a functional lens, you can do it through a product lens, you can do it through um, things like work packages. So most importantly for me, there's some parts of a project which are ordered systems, so they tend to be predictable. And there's some parts of a project which are very, very emergent. They require different approaches, but we don't tend to implement that through the risk management process. We tend to apply a one size fits all, which means we're always chasing a tail with risk. So should the process of risk management be more about avoiding the avoidable, which makes it sort of much more analytical driven? So a lot of these risks aren't actually risks, they're variability. So weather is not a risk. It's a variability factor on a project. If you want to mitigate that, you can connect your schedules with a weather model. And so the Met Office, we can start to use that to predict what we need to change in our project. So we take account of a windy day, which is going to win the cranes off, or it's going to be an extreme weather event, and what we're going to do about it. So we can start to adjust on the fly, which then makes it a lot more machine learning driven, and it makes it a lot more analytical. So my provocation to you as well, if we ban the word risk tomorrow, how would we describe what we're trying to do? And for me, it's about minimizing the downside and maximizing the upside through the lens of different stakeholders. It's not just one lens, different stakeholders. That is much bigger than risk. And lastly, so just to counter Wes's point about uh, things like artificial intelligence, there was a Turing test, which is about human level performance. The thing about human level performance, we can now achieve it in some use cases. So they're getting more forensic now about what do we mean by human level performance. I've posted something into the chat where the experts thought about three years ago that some of this capability would be available 2030 to 2060. And now they've brought all their estimates forward in the next two to three stroke five years. So this stuff is moving at a phenomenal pace. And I think as a profession, we're not keeping up with it. So that's my provocation. I'll pass the button back to you, Andy. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Martin. So keep that in mind in terms of um, you know, what 
if we replace the word risk management, what would we call it? So I'll come back to that one. So uh, Mark, um, I'd like to bring you in uh, for your uh, provocation. So uh, in particular, really the impact on the risk manager. I think you're going to give us uh, some thoughts on that. Yeah. So um, when I was thinking about this debate, um, my mind was cast back when I started work in the 1980s. And I can see that the convergence of the technologies which we've got now are very similar to the way that the 1980s um, transformed the spaces of like um, factories and offices when we introduced technologies such as PCs. Um, now, I know many of you on the audience are probably not old enough to remember that, but I certainly do. Back in those days, we used to have memos, paper memos and intercompany letters. Yeah, there were rows of draftsmen where I used to work um, and they were all mostly men. And then we had typing pools, uh, mostly females, typing, uh, transcribing notes and letters. Um, we had specialist bookkeepers who manually update the ledgers. And we had graphic artists who would uh, create view graphs for those who remember view graphs. And everyone had their own set of skills and they worked in their silos. Um, then the PC came along and all of a sudden everybody had word processors and CAD packages and spreadsheets and PowerPoints. And they were empowered then uh, to start working more effectively and efficiently with those tools to, to use essentially the same data that they always had, but it was more readily available. And as a consequence, it swept away so many of those old ways of working. And as a consequence, some of the specialist roles that, required, uh, that were required in those days. And now we find ourselves in the 2020s in a very similar position, I think. Um, we've got project managers, we've got project schedulers, cost estimators, project administrators and from my personal uh, perspective, project risk managers. OK, so they're all doing their their jobs on the project. Uh, all with their own areas of expertise and all looking at the same type of data set through their own lens, as Martin called it, um, all to achieve the same end game, the delivery of their uh, project objectives. But um. These new technologies, of which AI is just one of them, I like to think of AI as being uh, the hub in the wheel of all the Internet of Things and the data analytics that are coming through with robotics and uh, essentially the way that we gather more data than we ever have done before. Um, and I think that's going to transform the project space almost as much as the 1980s transformed the office space. It's going to be pretty much unrecognisable from the draftsman and the typing pool. Um, it made me laugh to think that what we're going to have is nothing, well, people are describing nothing more than an electric typewriter for the typing pool, and we're actually not going to have the typing pool at all. Um, the term I like to think of is project co-pilot, and the project co-pilot, I think, will enable a small handful of individuals, whether they be called project managers or have another title, but those human operators will cover the work of all the several sub-disciplines that were previously before them, the schedulers and the risk managers, um, to enable them to effectively and efficiently gather the data that they need to act on decision choices. So the choices will be presented to them on which they would need to make decisions. OK, now, why do we still need a person in the loop to achieve that? Well, because we're never going to be able to digitise 100% of all of our stakeholders' expectations and requirements. And we're always going to need to have an intermediary to manage the, the requirements of the human stakeholders in the delivery of the project. But essentially, the only role within a project will be that managing and handling of human interactivity, simply because I don't believe that the machines will yet be capable of doing that. So that's my contention. Uh, there'll be no more project managers as we understand them. There'll be no more project teams uh, in the sub-disciplines. There'll just be a handful of people with a project co-pilot to support them. Great, thank you, Mark. So not only uh, will risk managers um, potentially be out of a of a job in your in your world um, in terms of the role, sorry, that that we've got but uh, other project roles are going to be equally affected as well and would be placed by this sort of uh, um, sort of um, uh, multi-skilled role of the project co-pilot or the project assistant. Um, brilliant. OK, Rod, you're in last, so not quite last word because we will have a discussion after this and bring in some thoughts from the 
the attendees, but you're also going to cover the impact on the role. And I think you've got a different perspective to Mark to, to offer. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for the introduction, Andy. Really good and fascinating to hear everyone's views. Uh, so I, I spent 25 years on major construction, defence, nuclear, transport, and it's scary. It's a lot when I did it up. It's over 100 billion. And I've seen such extremes. Um, I'm passionate about data. Uh, I worked at Coca-Cola where I did electronic data interchange, EDIs, when you mentioned that as something else now. But, um, you know, it was so important from things like a dispatch advice to invoicing, how things were done, test, test, test. Um, and I'm not seeing that transformation piece now. It's sort of like Big Bang. Um, you know, uh, I think we need to look at the root cause. We, we, this session is about the risk manager. The daily life of risk managers is sort of like we have poor schedules, poor cost information, poor contracts out of date. You know, I heard some, I think it was um, Wes talking about workshops. We don't want workshops. We want holistic, integrated information. And it is so hard, so hard to, to get that on, on, our, on our projects. And this poor information, you know, we should have great scope and business information models driving that, you know, uh, decision making. But we, we're getting poor information and decision making and it's influencing. And I actually think I'm really looking forward to AI. But, you know, Martin and I have had several discussions. I think we, we're, I, I really believe it's going to make big changes. I actually think it's going to highlight where there's poor project managers who aren't attending to those elements. So I was going to move on. To, I'm going to move on to the history now. I worked on Heathrow Airport that was 4.2 billion on time, on budget. Um, and a lot of those people that worked with myself on there are now in very senior positions. It was an incredible achievement. But since then, PMO disciplines have been really ne neglected and or destroyed, in my opinion, due to cost savings by, you know, accountants and things at the top level. You know, Hinkley Point C, they say they haven't got enough money to pay for roles, to make the senior roles and, you know, experienced people to come in and then suddenly the costs go up last week by 10 billion pounds um we've got pmo failures you know like i said i did electronic invoicing you know why haven't we got that in project controls we shouldn't even have schedules flying around we should have controlled electronic messages for all of this stuff all of it but it's, it's just not there qra uh, another thing you've got integrated cost and schedule risk analysis many people are stuck on siloed cost and schedule you know, and uh, how do you manage your schedule path cost effectively on with, in relation to cost estimation, uncertainty, cost and duration? How do you recover and expedite it? We're nowhere near it. Another one, Power BI. We just sacked all our database experts and reporting. There you go. Power BI is going to do everything and it hasn't happened. I think a lot of companies are operating on the Pareto approach now. So doing... 80% of the work for 20% of the cost. So they don't want, they want to someone else to do it and buy them or get them in. Um, so we're in that challenging time now. And, and but the, the thing is to say that there are major companies following the, our current processes and making huge profits. Look at the, you know, why isn't yours? There's the future, we've got to look at things like system integration. Power Apps is doing some fantastic things, I think, better than AI presently. And then also looking at the role of the, a new APM proposed chief project officer. Uh, you know, I think risk managers have been blocked from escalating problems. Someone mentioned that previously, and I'm actually uh, want a chief risk officer. The, la the last things I was going to say is like, I really want to engage with this stuff. I've spoken to like Dev, the CEO in plan and said, why aren't you putting costs on the schedule and doing a holistic view? But here's my, you know, here's my game changer. So we've got, I think the role's an AI assisted PM. I think the current PMs and program managers hate doing this stuff. And I actually think that risk managers are best placed to become the future PMs. So I think bring it, bring AI on and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. So, so thanks, Rob. So I've got Mark on one end of the spectrum saying that uh, risk uh, managers role will go in the same way that the draftsman and the typing pool went in the in the 1980s. And Rob, the other end of the spectrum, uh, saying that uh, actually the role will change, but actually risk manager is the future. So it's going to be elevated into the sort of the project management space. 
Uh, or even would you say the CPO uh, position, Rob, as the most senior risk manager? Yeah. So, and, I, and I, I'm assuming, Rob, you're saying that's because of the analytical skills and the ability to make sense of information uh, that, that risk managers have um, as to why they would change role and, and perhaps take over the role of the PM. Is that fair? Bouncing back I to you? I think so. And I, I, but, but I think here's the thing with everything. It's, it, it's about the human skill to be able to transform people and ways of working. So is that a lot of our PMs and program managers have those people skills and motivational skills at the moment. And they're, they're very extremely important to transform and, and take people on, on the way. The best transformations I've seen are where you've had great you know, leaders with great buy into that transformation, really top to bottom engagement. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Rob. So, one element that I want to bring Martin back in on uh, that you covered there, Rob, is around, you know, that that a root cause of you know project performance issues, you know, tends to be sort of what I would call just poor practice. You know, you're not not necessarily following or applying the good practice that we know makes a, a difference. Um, a lack of integration as well, and I think Martin, that's sort of what you were saying as well, which is. You know, th there's a predictability that if we, you know, if we have poor practice, we'll have poor projects. So if we're not doing the basic things right, um, then things will go wrong on our projects. So is the analytics there helping us identify where that poor practice is and therefore where the interventions are required? So is it, is it just different what we're doing rather than dealing with uncertainty? We're just managing poor stuff. So from my perspective, if those poor practices, right? People talk about good practice and poor practice. I don't know what good practice is. So we've got a body of knowledge. So it's come about from years and years and years of working, but we can't necessarily evidence that that is the best way of doing it. So if we do it through a scientific way, we take each of these variables one by one and say that risk management done this way is the best way of solving that. So Andy, if I could just throw it back to you for your view on every project is an experiment and then once you've covered that i'll come back in well yeah okay so my my thoughts on projects being experiment is that um if projects uh, weren't an experiment we would know exactly how to do them and all projects therefore would succeed and the fact that all projects don't succeed means that you know, we're, we're trialing and, and thinking of new ways to, to manage them and the way that we perform experiments if you go back to your school days whether you did um, o levels or gcses um is that um you had it under controlled conditions and you you know you made those observations you knew your methods you knew the equipment that you had you knew who was performing the experiment you made those observations and then you you know applied uh, the learnings from it based upon where the differences were um and we need to do the same the same in projects but we don't necessarily have the data to enable us to experiment uh, in that way. Um, but I'd like to bring um, uh, Wes uh, back in. Uh, so Wes, you talked about augmented uh, mm. intelligence, saying we don't have AI, it's something to, to assist us, which is uh, not dissimilar in terms of um, uh, what, what Mark was saying, in terms of sort of the project co-pilot or the project uh, assistant. Um, but I just sort of want to flag up one bit. You talk about removing the uh, the, the human element of bias. Um, but since it's the humans that are developing these uh, AI machines and feeding them uh, with data, then then our AI algorithms have uh, a, um, a potential for bias too. So how do we, uh, you know, sort of uh, make sure we don't just replace one form of bias with another form of bias? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Garbage in, garbage out. If we're just looking at our own historic data and putting algorithms against that to predict the future, we're only sort of predicting the, the quality of the data that we fed in in the first place. Um, when it comes to workshops, the loudest person in the room is the one that sways the the, the decision using data driven methods, I think we can remove the person, the loudest person in the room and all data sources get um, get an input. I think an example that I would I would use is um, is is part of the dabbling we're doing with AI within the nuclear sector at the minute. Um, it's called risk live as, as we're terming it. So this is a 
a tool that's going to help people to do horizon scanning. So if anybody else is like me, uh, every year you'll get the global risk report, you'll get the IRM's risk predictions, you'll get all these different outputs from um, um, from organisations across the globe. Try and whittle that down into some kind of output to present to senior leaders to say, are we worried about this? What are we going to do about it? And again, the biases in those room from people's views on some of those risks are um, are going to sway the things that a business looks at and it might miss the mark. Um, the Risk Live application that we're developing currently is essentially a little spider that is constantly sourcing information from regulated news outlets and unregulated news outlets and social media. So Twitter, um, The Economist, all these different sources of information and it's tagging keywords that we've got. So we've got some very high level risks for our uh, sector. There's keywords in there, whether it's supply chain, whether it's uh, security, those sorts of things, and it will be constantly sourcing that data um, on a daily basis, on a minute by minute basis, hour, uh, daily, weekly, well, however we set it, and constantly bringing that into a consistent output for a decision maker to say, this is what I'm, this is what we think based on what everybody's talking about. Um, that you should be worried about. Now, of course, that'll still come down to human bias, but it's better than having seven, it's better to have seven billion people commenting on something or reporting on something as opposed to having seven people in a room with, with very succinct biases. So I think we'll never get away from removing the bias, um, but by getting a bigger pool of more current data, I think it helps us to, uh, to whittle that down. Um, if I may, I might just have to, uh, to ask Rob uh, a quick question as well. So there was oh, a, a comment, come, comment come through in the, in the chat, which, which made me smile because I was thinking the same thing. It was a very interesting land grab. I'll use the person's comment uh, that was used in it. A very, inter a very interesting land grab that risk managers will be the project managers uh, of the future, as opposed to the project managers just learn yeah. about risk and coordinate this, or the project uh, schedulers or the planners, the, uh, whoever it is. Why? What is this bit of self-preservation or is this actually no, because you think risk managers are the best place to, uh, yeah, to, to I, be I think, yeah, like, like I said, I'll tell you where it comes from is we, we thought, I think Andy, you mentioned it, that a lot of this is like poor practice, not doing things. 99% of my life is fixing schedule problems, scope problems, cost problems and PMO alignment problems. And in doing that, I think the things that AI are going to fix, what, how are you going to change those people? If they're not doing it now, I don't think they're going to want to, you know, it's like force, you know, you, is AI just going to bad, badger people as, well, as much as risk managers, more, less? I think that it's more likely they're going to ignore it and those people will just get, but I think AI is going to be fantastic for highlighting those problems onwards and upwards. And one thing I was going to say, is like, like I said, uh, Andy, about the chief project officer and the chief risk officer is from my experience, there are numerous times where problems and issues have been blocked from being taken upwards by middle management, leadership, etc. And then hence cause problems on the programme. So that, I, 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 yeah, I don't, you know, PMs, I don't, you know, PMs to me, pro current, our current are more people, people out there on site and not very, you know, they, they don't like the tech. I don't think they like dotting the I's, crossing the T's. So that's where the challenge lies. And what, what I was going to go to Martin, you know, and my question to Martin is we need pilots, major pilots and with Andy to like put these things in place and try these things out. And I think you'll find the risk managers, this thing's about removing risk managers. I think the, the risk management industry really want this and will be really engaged with you to, uh, you know, transform and deliver this. So I was going to ask Martin, how are we, yeah, well, you know, let, what are we do doing? That. So yeah, go, 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 I've asked Martin and I've got a question. So Martin, we'll give you, I'm going to give you a couple of questions to ponder at the same time. So Rob, you go first and then I'll add yeah. my question to Martin so, as well. So it's very simplistically, what like I said, many of these things in the past have been transformed very poorly. What are we doing to make sure AI is really, you know, we, you know, I want to, I'd like to work with you on some kind of opportunity register, you know, the, of things and elements in programs that should be done, but you know, things like scope missions. But what are we doing to really push this out there and make say, look, we've done this, we used AI, and it was a roaring success. 
Okay, so that's one oh. question, Martin. The next question I want you to think about as well. So uh, Deepak um, responded to one of your earlier um, provocations around, um, you know, a lot of risks that happen were never on the risk register. So how do we have confidence that all of our risk analysis is still going to capture these sort of uncertain things that will happen on our projects? Um, the Deepak's uh, counter to that is uh, there's lots of things that that are captured through change control and and other things, just that we haven't acted upon them. So so how do we counter that bit as well, where actually we we do we do the analysis and it's perhaps a human factor. It's the behavioural things that Rob's talking about that just prevent us from them taking the action that's that's needed on the project. So are we still going to be blinded by the facts available to us and then we still ignore them, which I think we're getting some of that. And then Martin, when you finish, since we've now had this battle on passing the questions, perhaps you can finish off with a question for for Mark. Sure, oh, great. So I've got quite a few things to get through there. So I think the first one is about why do people not follow process, all right? So if it's three o'clock in the morning and you're driving up to see your parents or something, and you could drive along the motorway at 150 miles an hour with no consequence and it's safe, etc., would you do it, all right? And for me, that some people would, but there is consequence, right? There's consequence in terms of being done by the police, you'll get sort of banned from driving, or it could be a really bad accident. There's no consequence at the moment for some of the project managers and some of the risk managers, et cetera, for not necessarily doing the job effectively. So what this starts to do, it starts to surface it. If you continually press the override button and say, I'm going to sort of ignore the machines, I'm going to ignore the evidence, I'm going to ignore the evidence, you leave a forensic trail, and it's got to be a brave person who is constantly pressing that override button. If you can do so through evidence, then fine. But if you're just ignoring it because you've been gung ho, you will leave a forensic data blue. So, in terms of the uncertainty point, we have got all this change control, we've got the logistics problems, etc. But we don't mind it. It's just there is a big exhaust plume from our data. We can easily integrate that through things like graph technologies. So, so sort of network knowledge graphs. If we start to integrate that then we can start to query the connections across that data and pull out of that patterns. And those patterns are things that we instinctively know if you've been around a bit, right? You'd know that there's a pattern in that data and that drives your personal heuristics. And what we're trying to do is to train a machine to pull out those heuristics. If there's patterns in the data, which is a logical discrepancy, then you can code it straight to Python and Python will pull those discrepancies out. In terms of the pilots, I think there's multiple sorts of pilots here. So we've been doing some work for the past, I don't know, 18 months or so with the community and more recently with some major clients, which is to look at these different time horizons. So one time horizon is about tweaking the here and now. So if we tweak the here and now, it's about things like dashboards and sort of power apps and just getting the data up a little bit. We start to reimagine it and we move towards variance analytics, then it's a different world order. It's very difficult to do that through one organization. So what we're doing, so it's something that David Belshaw is helping to lead. So David Belshaw is pulling together a coalition of major clients who are saying, let's start to unlock some of this stuff together. If we can think of all these different modules of capability that we can all work on, and better still, if we can work on them as part of a free training program through the apprenticeship, if we can all sort of pool our efforts, we can start to deliver hundreds of these modules of capability as a free byproduct of a free course. Why would we not do that? So that's what the coalition is trying to do. So for me, the risk managers have been trained on processes of the past. They've not been trained on what we need them to know in the future. So all the processes about filling in risk registers and, and the uncertainty analysis that they do, I don't think it's appropriate anymore in the future world that we're going to be in. Right? It's not about feeding the machine. This is now starting to use all of these tool sets so we can start to preempt all of this variance. And what we're trying to do is to relieve people of all this burden of going around nagging people about if you filled in your risk register, if you updated your management actions, if you've done this, if you've done that, if you've done something else. Let's take all that burden off them and give them some superpowers so they can start to look around corners. 
so they can see through walls. They can start to preempt some of this stuff and they can optimise in one scenarios. That's a cool place to be. That's a much better place to be than being a traditional risk manager. What does that role title so what will that role title be in the future? I've got an idea. That's something the profession needs to work out, but it's a different role. It's not a risk manager or a project manager. It's a different sort of role, and I don't think that person exists today. I'm starting to see some of them starting to emerge, so in places like Leeds and some of Calpine and in places like CISC as well, I'm starting to see those people emerge, but I don't think it's yet a fully-fledged career pathway, but it's coming at pace. So my sort of question back... Morning, Martin. So my question back to Mark is, so Mark, these risk managers have got a lot of domain expertise. They really understand the processes. They really understand how everything works. If we pass all that over to the data people and just say, right, it's now a data problem, it's not a risk problem, we lose all of that sort of domain expertise. And now it just becomes a numbers problem. So can you help me to understand what a middle ground might look like so where we pull some of the people up the value chain and we pull some of the data people across into the risk sort of space. So what does that future look like in your view? Okay, um, so I want to reflect something that Robert said, and that is it's about people and about communication and about having the interpersonal skills to be able to coordinate between the different stakeholders on the delivery of the, of the project. OK, and I think that's where the value add proposition from a risk manager or call us whatever you want in the future. But it's the person who has the interhuman skills to help decision makers understand the decisions uh, based on the data which is being fed. Because at the moment, I, the, the challenge I see here about the so-called data and the, the data uh, feed is the source of the data is very much human derived at the moment. And this is why I don't think it's all about AI. It's about Internet of Things, sensors, monitoring, uh, space satellite imagery. Yeah, there's so much that technology can bring to clean the human element out of the data gathering such that we're, we're making decisions on real data. You know, it would be quite simple to use the blockchain to monitor the progression of the supplies in the supply chain. Yeah, it'll be easy to use uh, video capture devices to see the progression of the construction on the construction site. It's easy to use satellite imagery to see how far the extension of the foundations have been uh, moved or, you know, the, the locations of the uh, other geospatial data that you can gather. All of that is pure data. It's not human centric data. So the challenge becomes how do the humans interpret and make the decisions? and not just make decisions in isolation, but make decisions in the middle of that very much uh, stakeholder orientated perspective where you've got uh, the end users, you've got society at large, you've got the owners and you've got uh, the people who are working on the project as well. So the value add from a human perspective, be those the risk managers or the project managers, is coordinating those decision makers with knowledge that you've got good, clean data to work with. Now, we're a long way from that, but with the advent of 5G, Internet of Things, and all those other technologies, coordinated by AI, which is a pattern recognition system, essentially, uh, and it brings together all the data so that we can make better, more informed decisions. And at the end of the day, projects will be delivered based on the quality of the decisions which are made. Great, thanks, Rob. And so I think one of the things, sorry, uh, Mark, I think one of the things you said earlier is about um, decision making and sort of the, uh, it, it, the the various roles that exist um, will be supplemented by this sort of, uh, you know, project assistant or co-pilot. So it's, it's more of a different future with this sort of a, a composite role that sort of uh, uh, is capable of multiple things, but perhaps using different analytics or support to enable that person to perform them. So it feels like um, you know, more of a, uh, a generalist than a specialist future that you're seeing there. Very much so. Like I said before, the, the typing pool and the man who used to draw up my Electra sets for when I used to do my view graphs. My goodness, I mean, you know, back in 1987 when I used to do view graph presentations. Where are those people now? You don't need them. You've got a 
you've got anybody who sits in front of a PowerPoint presentation can create your, your view graph as it was. Exactly the same is going to happen in the future. We're not going to have a risk manager and a scheduler and a cost controller because that data is going to be presented fully formed, clearly articulated, properly categorized to a decision maker and they say decision A yeah, we'll, we'll take this route. Decision B will take this route. And the consequences of those decisions would be presented back to them as well. So we'll have foresight based on clean data and not best guesses based on human biases. And I think that's yeah. one of the issues that we have at the moment. Great. Thanks, Mark. So the uh, the chat window has been pinging like popcorn in a in a hot pan while we've been uh, talking and and actually I've not been able to keep up with them uh, in terms of some some great feedback so I do encourage uh, everyone uh, if you still have access to the the chat after the meeting finishes it's uh, well worth a, a read through them so there's not long to go now so what I want to do is to get a, another temperature check in terms of uh, our thoughts on the future of risk management in the context of AI versus human uh, insights. So we're going to rerun a couple of those polls that I did uh, from earlier, um, if I have the ability to share my screen again. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to uh, give you a, another sort of 30, 45 seconds each for sort of uh, closing remarks. And uh, and then perhaps we'll give a, a shout out in uh, whoever can come up with the best name for risk management uh, in, in the last seven minutes in the chat window. So what what uh, if I can get our questions up? So hopefully you're seeing that. Here we go. So it's that scale of one to ten again. To what extent do you believe risk management will be transformed in that next three year time horizon? It's a slightly different code from before, by the way. So it's um, three four one four five zero six. So it's a different code to the one you had at the beginning of the, the webinar. And this is where my analytical skills are going to be put to the test because uh, I have to interpret the results. Um, so top ranked is eight um, and second is 10 and seven. So the first three are skewing to the top end. Um, Yeah, so it looks like at number 10 is our top our top rank this time round. It wasn't the first time round. I think our highest rank was uh, was eight or so. So it looks like um, uh, based upon our discussions today, the, the mood has shifted slightly to it's more likely to be radically different than, than less likely. It doesn't seem to be that sort of camel's uh, double hump um, that we saw at the beginning. So the next question, are you in the in the Rob camp or are you in the Mark camp in terms of uh, the the role of the risk manager? Is, is the role of the risk manager going to be um, uh, replaced by AI um, or, or you know not at all? We've got a few. OK, let's leave it running for a little bit. It looks like we believe it's going to be transformative, um, but it feels here there's mixed views in terms of whether that's going to be uh, replacing the risk manager role or not. So it's going to be transformative, but quite a chunk of you are feeling that the risk manager role will still be around. And there's a few of you feel that the risk manager role will be replaced by AO, but no one's gone with the completely vote. OK, last uh, um, question uh, uh, is that temperature test is, um, do you believe the risk manager's role is going to be even more important? Or is the risk manager going to take over from the project manager and rule the project management world? Or are we going to have these generalists that Mark uh, introduced where they're capable of doing scheduling, cost estimating, you know, reporting a variety of things using the sort of AI and analytical tools available to them? OK, so we're skewing here to the role being more important. So more of the votes, the top votes are in the 
more important end of the spectrum. Um, actually, what I didn't do, um, perhaps when you all joined, we should have asked you what your role is, because uh, if we have a lot of people here who are risk managers. Uh, I suspect that may influence uh, your thoughts on the future importance of the the risk management role. Before I go and offer um, the the last thoughts um, back to our four speakers, um, I would also like you to uh, just give a bit of feedback uh, from the webinar today in terms of uh, the insights that uh, uh, may have been gained. So uh, what are you going to do when you get back to your office effectively? OK, so a good number of you are going to go go away and you know, develop your understanding further. There's lots of great um, uh, podcasts, YouTube channels and, uh, and, and uh, bloggers out there in this topic, not least uh, our very own Martin on, on the call here. Um, so it's a good source of information. Um, uh, some of you are going to get more involved with the community of practice, which is great. Um, is that what Martin said, that coalition? groups working together to sort of solve different parts of the risk management uh, puzzle and some of you are going to go and uh, go on some training and uh, and try and apply those to your current role so that's a great um, set of um, responses there so thank you very much right we have two minutes left so by my mathematics that means less than 30 seconds each if you could give us your final thoughts i'm going to do it in reverse order so rob you can go first yeah, just it's been a fascinating conversation. I mentioned about that, you know, about the risk manager sort of lot. Like I actually think, you know, what's going to happen? We haven't mentioned a, a job, project controls managers. I think that's what's going to be replaced. So the project controls manager is normally responsible for bringing together the holistic position, you know, position for schedule cost. But again, that role seems to have you know, gone so low down on the spectrum. I think that's going to be the AI. And I think the risk, and as always, will be there to assure what's going on. I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's the project controls managers that need to be transformed into AI. And that's the role that needs replacing. But the risk managers will be there always to assure and escalate when necessary. Thank you, Andy. Great. Thank you, Rob. So, um... Mark, you're next. Final thoughts. Um, final thought is things are changing exponentially, not linearly. Humans find it difficult to cope with exponential change. Um, things are going to change very rapidly and very soon as well, I believe. Um, so the best thing that risk managers who are on this call can do is to ensure that they're building and developing their soft human skills. And it's the soft human skills that are going to be the value add for the future because you're not going to be able to compete with a machine which is smarter than you are. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. Martin. So two things for me, Andy. So this is not going away, right? This is just accelerating at pace. It is an exponential world. There is a humongous amount of money being thrown at this. So all the big players are in the your Microsofts and your Metas and all that sort of stuff. So you can't avoid it. It's the second thing is. Get ready for it. So if this was a risk for your livelihood, for your career, what are you doing to mitigate that risk? And for some people, I think they're putting their heads in the sands and they're hoping it's going to go away. It will not go away. So get upskilled in it. Get ready. So we deliver some free training on it as well, all funded through government to get you ready for this new future. Just climb aboard. And let's take the rocket ship somewhere because it's an exciting place. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Martin. Uh Wes. Oh, no, yeah, so I, I love how Rob has promoted all the risk managers in the world and sacked all the project controls managers uh, <laughs> in the world in the in the space of the last hour. So what I would say is I think us thinking about whether the profession exists in 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 some amount of time um, is a long way off for us. I, I just I really don't believe we are there. But I think as risk managers, risk management professionals, we can exploit some of the stuff that is already really readily available. You only need to type into Chat GPT what are the top ten risks to this, what are the top test ten risks to that, what does a risk policy look like. You've immediately saved yourself probably two or three hours worth of work. So what I would say is as risk managers, we need to understand what's already available, readily available, just start using it to make our outputs uh, a bit better. And I think when we get into that mindset, we do maybe move into that space a little bit more easily when the time comes. Great. Thank you, Wes. And uh, I'm going to do my shout out now for the best 
name, new name for risk management. So it goes to David Fisher as the uh, value defenders and amplifiers. So there we go. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll run with that one. And um, so final thoughts from me. So I, I've been thinking as you've been describing all of this and particularly sort of prompted perhaps somewhat by the Internet of Things and the, the multiple sources of data that we're, we, we need to sort of consume and assimilate and understand. And I guess for me, I think a new uh, name for risk managers going forward would be a bit like um, a Spider-Man. So I think you're going to be the Spider-Man of projects with your spider sense uh, connected into all your data sources to do that sense making of what's going on. So when your spider sense starts tingling and it's in your supply chain or it's in your stakeholders or whatever, then you can act in time to keep your project uh, true to its objectives. And uh, responding to another comment that was in the chat window about the uh, dangers of what can go wrong if we rely on this too much as well. Uh, as we know with Spider-Man, uh, with great uh, power comes great responsibility as well. So we do need to make sure that we use it wisely. So get those spider senses tingling, uh, make sense of it, um, but be careful with how you use it. And uh, that's my final thought. Thank you very much to our four uh, panellists, if we can give them a, a traditional um, show of thanks. And uh, thank you also for the fantastic comments uh, running through that chat window for the course of this webinar. And my apologies for overrunning by a couple of minutes and hopefully see you all again on another webinar sometime soon.